Between the Covers, the show for readers and writers and lovers of books. I'm Stephanie, and I'm a publisher at Red Penguin Books. We're a publishing house that works with authors of all types and genres. So whether you have a book in your head, or maybe you have 300 sheets of loose leaf in a drawer, yes, we do get envelopes full of loose leaf to publish, or maybe you just have a book in your heart and you would like to get that out on the pages, visit redpenguinbooks.com and unleash your inner author. I'm so delighted to be joined by three authors who have most certainly unleashed themselves today. Joining us, well, from merry old England is Jan Domagala, who is the science fiction author of Ronin. Well, Ronin and about 10 other books that uh, we are so thrilled are gonna be released here in the United States. Kevin Johnson is the author of Insufficient Postage. And whether you have ever worked for the Postal Service or even just gotten mail and wondered about the stories behind how it got into your mailbox, you'll want to hear all about Insufficient Postage. And Peter Katsukas wrote Jailhouse Confidential after many, many years working at Rikers Island, a place that I definitely have never visited and learned quite a bit about reading. And now I'm kind of relieved I've never visited. Lucky so, you. <laughs> welcome to all of you. Uh, Jan, thanks for joining us from across the pond. Thanks for having me. I'm, I'm pleased to be here. Absolutely thrilled to have you here. And before we get to the book, how are things going? Uh, I guess I could ask pandemic wise in England. You're safe and healthy, I hope. Yes, very. Yes, uh, we are in lockdown. Uh, the country's in lockdown, but we are we are learning to cope. It's the third time now, so we're getting there. We're just okay. waiting for the, the uh, vaccine to come and have, be distributed. When are they thinking? Have they started distributing yet? They started, yeah. They've done several. Oh, they did give some figures out this morning. I think it's something like 2.3 million people have been wow. uh, vaccinated already. Uh, it's a long way to go yet, though. Right, right. And and you're such a young man that you're not on any vaccine. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> uh, I'm about halfway down the list um, over the 65 category. Right, right. No, I, I know we all know where we are on the list probably at this yeah. point. Yeah. I think I, I, I checked on the calculator. My I should be getting my uh, vaccination in early March. Oh, that's not so bad. That's not so bad. I know 80 year olds here in America who can't get theirs till April. So you're doing pretty well. Oh, well, well that's okay then. That's made me feel a bit better. Absolutely. So tell me a little bit about um, how you got your start writing science fiction. Oh, right. Um, well, um, I was looking to, uh, science fiction has always been a big, uh, a big must with me. Uh, that was my first joy in, in learning to read everything that was science fiction I used to devour uh, but lately I couldn't find the sort of book that um, I, I that really grabbed me really grabbed my attention I wanted something uh, between Die Hard and Total Recall so <laughs> I couldn't find that so I decided to have a go at writing it myself and that's basically how Ronin came about well that, that's what they say is that uh, you should write the book you that want you want to read. read yeah that's it yeah that's what i did I, I read that somewhere i can't remember who who made that quote but um i certainly took it on on board and uh, 10 books later i'm still going <laughs> fantastic what would you say is the hardest thing about writing i mean 10 books that's a lot of books yeah um hardest thing was getting started I, what I, my my process is um i have an idea and I, then I sort out my characters uh, and then then just start to write, uh, see where it goes. I start off with an idea that's like a, a, a germ and then it just propagates. Wow, wow, that's amazing. And, but you know, you say, and then it just goes. It just, like it's well, so easy to write 10 books. Well, no, uh, it's, it's easier once you've got the the basis written down uh, and the Ronin is the basis so from there I was able to expand on that uh, add, add new characters new worlds and uh, new idea just take it and, and see what happened what happened to them basically right 
And, uh, and now you have the books that you've always wanted to read. Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> but now I just want somebody else to read them as well. That's the goal. That's yeah, the goal. That's the goal. Other people to read yeah. them as well. Yeah. <laughs> now, while you were writing your books, did you ever get surprised by where they were going? Like you thought I was going in this direction? Oh, all the time. Yeah, all the time. Yeah. I've, I've quite often been writing a passage and I thought, well, I'll just see that coming. Oh, that's a good idea. I'll see where this leads now. And then, and, you know, you, you, you get off uh, on, uh, you have a set idea of which way you want to go. And then something will happen, either a conversation or you think that won't work. And then you, you go where, where it will work. And then you just, it just, it can take you into unexpected places. That's exciting. That's that's one of the things that, you know, we've we've spoken, um, you and I, and, and certainly on this show about how authors might be people who plan every detail or people who kind of go by the seat of their pants. That's me, you're, definitely. Like, you're a seat of the pants kind of oh, a person. Oh, definitely, yeah. I, I think that if I wrote fiction, I would be much more of the plotting person, just yeah. because of my personality. But it must be exciting to be writing and not know what's going to happen next. It is, yeah. That's uh, yeah. I have to. I, I have to enjoy what I'm doing, otherwise it just doesn't make sense, and it just I can't. I can't invest myself in in the story. If I'm not enjoying it, then if I'm not enjoying it, then I can't expect anybody else to either. <laughs> That's an excellent point. <laughs> now Thank your you. your books are certainly lending themselves to the visual. Do you watch? Movies, TVs, do you have any favorites that you enjoy? Oh yeah, anything with uh, anything with large visuals. Uh, I'm a big fan of the Marvel movies and the DC movies, uh, science fiction, Star Wars, Star Trek, anything like that. Oh, you're talking so my I, alley. I'm, I'm a big fan too. Yeah, I try to write in a cinematic frame of mind. Um, I, I sort of visualize what, what, I'm, what I'm writing and hopefully, um, it all transposes as a, a visual image in your brain. Does that make sense? It, it does make sense. Yeah. Now, now, since you have obviously, you know, watched a lot and researched a lot, I guess I should ask you. So are there aliens out there? <laughs> oh, no. I would be remiss if I said no, I, because there's the, the, the universe is such a vast place. I would be surprised if there weren't any, any, anybody else out there. You must have stolen that line from me. That's exactly my answer. Oh, right. <laughs> it's that I have no idea, but I can't imagine that we're alone. Yeah, great minds think alike. <laughs> great minds think alike. So what is next on your writing journey? Are you working on a new book right now? Uh, well, you've mentioned 10. I've got book 11 already written and I've got, I've started book 12. Uh, I've also got a... Uh, an offshoot of the Colsec series um, with another set of characters that have sort of segued away from the main the main storyline. But I also write uh, in two other genres, well, another genre, I should say, under under a pen name of, of Jack Dylan. I write thrillers. So I've written six of those and I'm, I'm writing another one at the minute. Mm. So there'll be four in one series and th a three in another. Okay, so you're putting pandemic and lockdown to good use. Oh, you well, you got to do something. <laughs> you got to do something to keep sane. <laughs> There's a lot of books getting written right now. That I can tell you. Yeah, yeah, I, can, I can imagine, yeah. I'm doing my bit anyway. <laughs> well, I'm glad you're doing your part in getting all those books written. Uh, while Jan is writing in different fiction genres, um, Kevin Johnson doesn't need to write fiction because his life was kind of fantastical as it was. Um, an insufficient postage, a week in the life of a new letter carrier. I hear that there'll be more books because this was only week one and that he didn't even have to make stuff up. It was just so amazing as it was. Welcome, Kevin. Nice to have you. Hello, Stephanie. And I know I'm calling you Kevin Cage Man, right? <laughs> 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 yes, I like that nickname. You got it, Cage Man. You got it. So, so that first week was just so unbelievable. It broke the charts, and you had to write a book. Yes. Uh, well, the story needed to be told. Uh, Nobody's had used the post office as a backdrop, and uh, working at the post office, so many things were we're always like, we we need to write a book about this. 
somebody needs to write a book about this. And, you know, of course, there are people like, well, of course, nobody will believe this. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's why I said it gave me a very new view into that mail that's landing in my mailbox every day. That's where I'm getting a lot of responses back like that also. So people are liking it. Are our fellow postal workers also reading it? I'm still waiting for the book to, to, to get the book so I can give my letter carrier one and um uh, I, I'm hoping that they will. I'm, I'm sure they're going to relate and they're going to be like, finally, somebody's told our story. <laughs> <laughs> That's a big responsibility to tell the story of an entire federal department here. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. But uh, I'm up for the challenge. <laughs> so tell me, as you were writing it, did it did it just naturally flow? Did you write it all in one shot? Was it like scraps of paper? You were in a bar one night writing things on napkins. How did this happen? I've been thinking about it for quite a while. And um, like you said, uh, th things would happen that, uh, and I would write down on little scraps of paper. And I had it, I had it planned out for, for quite a while. And, um, and it, so I wrote, I wrote a bunch of pages and stuff. And I, saw, I tried to shop it around until I, uh, until I got it uh, introduced to Red Penguin uh, and you. Uh, I was really a little hesitant, you know, I wasn't sure if it would go anywhere and whatnot. And, and then once it, the, the hard part was finding the time to do it mm. because I'm working, I'm working two jobs right now. So uh, it's finding the time to do it. That's a lot. And it, does take time. it does take time. So, yes. um, uh, well, when you came to me, I don't know if you remember that I mentioned to you that my parents worked for the post office. Yes, 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 I do remember. So I said, ooh, here's a book we definitely need to be publishing here. And uh, I got to pass this along to mom and dad. <laughs> well, I, uh, there's, there's over 520,000 people who work for the post office. So everybody, it is quite a few. So uh, wow. now I think it would be interesting. You said you're working two jobs. Is one of them still the post office? No, 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 no. Um, I, I was teaching for a while. I actually uh, left the post office and I, I got a math degree. And the reason why I got a math degree is because I, I'm not a very good writer. But I learned how to, I learned how to become a better writer. You know, I, I didn't have to do as many papers, but I, I, you know, I learned how to become a better writer. For, you know, by going to school. And uh, but now I'm working in a, a, a housing. Okay. Uh, homeless. I'm a director for a nonprofit. Now you are the first person who has ever said I got a math degree because I wasn't a great writer. I mean, math is <laughs> its own animal. There. I mean, goodness. <laughs> yes, it is. I did have a you know a little propensity for math. I think so. You have to have a propensity for math. So this uh, book, insufficient postage, is a week in the life. Your first week on the job. Um, so after that first week, you quit. That was it, or there was more. <laughs> No, no, no. I stayed for eight years. But what happened with the book, it's like cleaning. You know how you like, okay, we clean here, and then you just keep going, and next thing you know, you do a lot more than you expected to. That's so uh, the, it, evolved, it evolved as, the, you know, as I was writing, and I was just like, oh, this just got so much, and there's so much more to tell, too. Right, right. Well, you know, that, it's funny when you said that about cleaning, there's always more. Did you see Jan nodding this time? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He probably has like three or four more books in his head right now. <laughs> I know. Just, just off this phone call, we're all going to have more books in our heads. <laughs> well, after you finish uh, exoriating the, uh, the post office, are you going to go into housing next? No, no, no. I, um, I want to tell another story about Long Island, growing up on Long Island. Nice. Where yeah. did you grow up? Um, Beth Page. Oh, fantastic. fantastic. Yeah, it's in Nassau. It yeah. has the golf courses and all that stuff. And I remember you mentioned it in the book that it was uh, one of the, yep. You. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Were they like, the latest with mail or there was something with uh, the Beth Page post office? Right. I, I mentioned how uh, the, the, the supervisor was like, oh, you know, we're motivated here at Farmingburg, and if you wanted to go to a country club, you should have went to Beth Page. Right, right. And I brought up my, I, I referenced my mailman when I grew up, Mr. Ray, who would always give us uh, rubber bands. We'd make rubber band balls. 
But you're right. Beth Page is known for, you know, golf courses and things like that. So I guess they're pretty exactly a little bit of a country club. That's for sure. <laughs> Well, certainly our next writer guest did not work in a country club, that's for sure. Um, Peter worked at Rikers Island for many years and wrote Jailhouse Confidential on the inside looking in about uh, many of his experiences there. And trust me, if you read the book, you'll be glad that we're on the outside looking in. Welcome, Peter. Thanks for joining us. Pleasure. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about your experiences there, how many years you worked there, et cetera, and what brought you to writing the book? I worked there uh, for 10 years on Rikers uh, in the 70s and 10 years at the Queen's House of Detention when I got promoted to captain. But most of the stories are from the 70s on the rock. Wow, on the rock. I like that, on the rock. <laughs> yeah, those stories are... are uh, you know, a lot of people don't believe it. You can't make this up in these stories, you know, and they're true. And I started writing these stories 17 years after retirement. Wow. Uh, how I started, I read an article in the newspaper. People over 50 should write their memoirs. There's a lot of interesting things. And that's uh, sparked the fire underneath me. And then the stories just started flowing. Not only jail stories, but stories from my childhood, becoming a teenager, my first girlfriend, my first car. That's the next book. <laughs> I love that there's a next book, but it's so true. You know, there's, um, kids today have no idea. Uh, I, you know how our parents probably said, you know, I walked to school 10 miles in the snow, yeah. <laughs> uphill, the whole thing. Um, I, I feel like now I say, cause I, I still have a son in high school. All I have to say is, you know, back when I was a kid, we actually went to school. We didn't do it on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> Online learning. So I'm glad you were writing these stories down. Now, 17 years later, this, the memories were still fresh, huh? They just came right back up again. You know, dormant for all those years. Wow. Uh, I, did, I did start, uh, you know, stickball stories. I started that way. And then I started thinking of, you know what? That's an interesting story. So I started writing the stories from the past uh, on Rikers. And uh, some of them, uh, you know, I had a friend that was a correction also just read the, the book. And uh, he said uh, it brought back uh, a lot of memories. He cried, he laughed, and he remembered. <laughs> and I have a warden friend that just read it. And, uh, you know, I'm getting good reviews. Let's put it that way. That's fabulous. That's fabulous. even my son's sister-in-law wrote something nice. She wishes it was longer. So I'm very surprised. I didn't know how people were going to react because some stories are a little heavy duty, you know? Yeah, they're very. And, and I'm guessing that your audience is one of, uh, you know, kind of a split. There are the people who this was something that they can relate to directly. And by you writing it, in essence, it's very cathartic for them as well that they can get it out. But then there are also people like me who have absolutely no experience in this world but it was so interesting, not just to, you know, we read news articles and statistics or whatever, but to actually read personal experience of what goes on, went on, et cetera. I have no experience with that. It was fascinating. Well, that era, I emphasize the 70s, much different than today, you know, how things were back then. Yeah. So uh, that's what you have to know, you know, realize when you're reading. You know, right. Some things are unbelievable. Uh, you know, you respect the officer and sometimes you don't. Right, right. A different time, a different time, not right. just in Rikers Island, but in everything. And don't forget, I, I was just turned 22 when I came on the job. 22. Yeah, what did I know? <laughs> the old time is they teach you. Oh no my matter gosh. what you were learned in the academy, you know, it's, you don't do that. You do what the old time is teaching, so, you know. And, and now you can pass it down in a book. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm very happy. I can't believe, uh, I guess any of us can't believe we published books, <laughs> you know, at our age. And, uh, and, and now people are, you know, with all of you, it, it's such a different world. And I always say this to new authors, you know, the day you publish, 
really in many ways is the first day of the rest of your life because it's different. You know, people are calling you, they read the book, they, they're giving you feedback. Um, you know, sometimes it's a little disconcerting, uh, you know, to have people. Uh, what, what do you find rougher when people are complimentary or if people say, oh, I wish you would have done this or done that. I don't know if people have said anything like that to you. I mean, people will say, um, how are you taking all the attention, shall we say? So far, I'm getting uh, good results, but uh, it does bother me when somebody uh, thinks they're the editor. <laughs> 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 I, I went through that while writing the book. If I gave a couple of stories to see their reaction, to see even stu uh, college students, college professors, uh, my retired fireman friend, just to see all different people, how they react to this, you know, what's my audience? And while you were going through that stage, and I'm so glad you did that, that's, that's something I always recommend, which is, we call it fancy, using beta readers, you know, giving, giving parts of the book or the whole book to people to read. And that's a very hard time, especially for a new writer, because when people tell you what they really think, it's right. sometimes not easy to hear. And you learn while writing, you learn things. Uh, a performing arts professor uh, read quite a few of the stories. And what he told me was, he said, I like the stories, but who is this person? <laughs> who wrote this book? You know, who is it? So he's telling me there's not enough about myself in the book. And that's why I incorporated some of my life stories. I kind of like melded, you know, into, uh, into other jail stories, like, like visits. Wow. I never saw uh, men visiting uh, inmates. I know one, one man is behind the bars. Right. It was always children and mothers no uncles, brothers, or anything else. That's how I incorporated my family life into those stories. You know, my relationship with my father, with my mother. And, you know, that's how I put myself into it. You know, that's a fabulous insight. And I'm so glad you said that for any of our future writers out there, is to make sure that you are in the story because people don't want to just, if I wanted to just learn about Rikers Island, I could read a history book. I want to know more about you, and I want to I want to see you in the story because now you, my friend, you know, you're sitting next to me and sharing. You know, we're swapping stories. If I get you, if you don't put yourself in there, we missed that. That was a great observation that somebody made. Yeah. So you know, even one story I wrote about Billy. If you read that one, you know, I was very uh, reluctant to write that story because and my children are adults now. But um, I said, let me write it in the third person, you know, and they won't know. But I couldn't help myself to put that last line in. And you know what I'm talking about. Yep, yep I do. You know? So, uh, you know, I guess that's writer's privilege. You could do it or you can't do it, you know. Well, that's the, that's the fun when it's your book. I mean, quite honestly, you get to do whatever you want to do. Um, it's nice to receive feedback like you were sending it around to get some feedback from people. Um, you know, at the end of the day, you could take the feedback or not take the feedback. It's your book. Right. <laughs> no, but That's it is good to hear from, from <laughs> other audience members or, you know, possible readers. Um, Kevin, did you have anybody read your manuscript besides me <laughs> before it went to publication? Yes, I did. I had my girlfriend uh, read it, and uh, she was always uh, receptive to it. And I, I, I was always telling people, like, little snippets here and there, like, oh, this is going to happen. Oh, I'm writing a book. Oh, that's going to happen. Oh, that's, you know, that you get a lot of... Uh, right, right. Good stuff. Good stuff. Now, yeah, well, one of my, favorite, my favorite thing that, ha that has happened so far is my mother and uh, my sister were talking about one character in the book. And the one's like, I think he's so funny. And then my sister's like, I find him annoying. <laughs> so, <clears throat> well, I'm glad you mentioned that because sometimes now, now the two of you, uh, Kevin and Peter, uh, essentially were writing memoirs. You, you were kind of, they were memoirs that were driven by a particular vocation um, as opposed to just purely your life. And that's one thing that makes it, sometimes people forget that and they think a memoir, we just 
you know, I was born on this day and they just kind of, you know, regurgitate everything that's ever happened. Yours are much more focused, which is fabulous to have that focus. But with any time you write a personal book or even a fiction book, at some point, you know, your mother might read it. And I've had authors who say, yeah, when my mother read this, she was a little horrified because it was personal. And, and now mom is saying, did you really do that? <laughs> and they're a little like mortified or, or Peter, you mentioned your children who yeah. are now grown, but that's exactly how I feel about this particular story. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And sometimes people will come to me with those very issues and they'll say, listen, I want to write, but I, I don't want to, I, I guess I could say, live with the repercussions. And sometimes people put a pen name on the cover or um, in, in your case, Peter, since it's different stories of what happened, um, you could, like was suggested to you, make one of them third person, take you completely out of the picture and talk about it as if you had no part in it. You know? right. I could have made just a blank line after Billy was. Right. Could have did it that way too, which is suggested too late. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? They're adults, and that's the way it was. I was in my twenties, and you know, maybe Kevin and Ronan getting curious now. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. You'll have to read the book. <laughs> yeah, <right>. Exactly. <laughs> but you know, it's those things that you know. Yes, I I understand. We all want to you know preserve our own you know reputations, shall we say? But in essence, when you get to a certain age, um, yes, you were 22 years old at the time, but also I think there's great value in people looking back and, and learning what you really were like, even exactly. for our own kids or True. associates. Right. You know, I wasn't born this age, you know? Yeah, right. <laughs> there was something that came before this. I wasn't just born at this age. But uh, <laughs> we're all who we are because of all those experiences. Exactly, exactly. And, th and that's what goes into the book is we are the product of our experiences. Now, uh, Jan, you write fiction. Are you one of the characters? Are you the protagonist? Are you the strong guy? <laughs> uh, I'd like to think so, yeah. Um, <laughs> I live vicariously through my characters. I, I, their, their life is the life I wish I could lead. But... You're not really like a superhero when you're oh not... no no nowhere near no <laughs> just, an, just an average joe <laughs> just an average guy he jumps into a, a phone booth and puts on a cape when we're not looking that's what he's actually Do we still have phone booths <laughs> <laughs> i've actually seen some phone booths and um i guess you know if they were kind of built in and it says, if you need to make a cell phone call, I think I saw them in a, like a hotel lobby or something, and you would sit inside to talk on the phone. I was like, that's a little Yeah. <laughs> we, still have, we still have the red telephone boxes in England. But well, of course you few. have the red telephone boxes in England. What's yeah. inside of them? Are there phones? Um, so I have not been inside one for years, so I couldn't tell you. I would, I would assume so, yeah. You know... But, I was in London last year, well, you know, before the lockdowns, of course, and I took pictures in one of those red phone booths. Yeah. And of course, there, there was a phone, now that I'm remembering. Yeah. I did pick up the phone and hold it to my ear just to kind of smile for the picture, but... Yeah. Did I, you get the dial tone? I, 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 I didn't put <laughs> any coins. I don't even know what to do anymore. Yeah. I don't think anybody does with those things. <laughs> who, who uses a landline anymore? We're all, all on, the, on the mobiles, aren't we? Exactly, exactly. But yes, they, they still have to have the red phone books, booths throughout London so that tourists like myself. Correct. Yeah, it is a big tourist attraction. It is a big tourist attraction to take the pictures with all of yeah. them. That's for sure. <laughs> so after all these words, thousands and tens of thousands of words that you've written, what advice would you give to someone who wants to start writing? What would you say is their first step? Um, pick a subject that you're really passionate about. Um, learn how to craft a story or just start with an idea. I mean, if for, for people who plot out, um, 
get your story idea and then plot it out, make make a character, make a list of characters, make a list of things that you, you want them to do or what want to happen, and then work through that that way. But if you're like myself, a uh, city of your pants kind of writer, just get an idea, get your characters in place, and then just see where it goes. But always, always, always do your best work. Uh, get somebody to look it over, get an editor, always do your best work. Fantastic. Fantastic. Cage Man, what would you say if somebody had uh, a very interesting experience on the job and wanted to, to write it down? How do they get started? Just do it. It's just like uh, going to the gym. If you tell yourself, okay, I'm going to go for 10 minutes, you're probably going to stay longer. Uh, yeah, so right. once you sit down, you start writing, the creative juices start flowing, and uh, you end up doing a lot more than you expected to, and it inspires you to start again tomorrow. Right. I like the way you brought in the juice thing. Is that you know? juice in your background there? <laughs> <laughs> What's that? I said, I like the way you brought in the gym analogy. Is that yeah. exercise equipment I see behind you? Uh, yes, it is. See? <laughs> and, and he just does it because he doesn't have laundry all over it. So he must be using it. <laughs> <laughs> it's my mind. Oh, it has been used as a code rack, but uh, I do. <laughs> Peter, what would you just say to somebody who wants to get started on their life story? Like uh, you su suggested, uh, even if you get a one idea or a little line, write it down because so often I've forgotten. Mm -hmm. I should have written it down. And it was just a great idea and I forgot it, you know? Yep. Um, and I'm interested more about the guys' uh, writer's block. Have they experienced that and for how long? Oh, yes. Question. And what do you do then? <clears throat> a lot of distractions, which causes writer's block, I guess. Absolutely. I've experienced that. I've had it for, it seemed like two months one time, you know? Really? Yeah. Really? And how and did you get You bang out the story sometimes two, three in a week, you know? Mm -hmm. It's amazing. How did you finally break through that two months of writer's block, Peter? I just waited it out. Because <laughs> sometimes I get a feeling a day or two before I'm going to write, like something's coming, but I don't know what it is. Uh -huh. I get that feeling inside in my gut, and then all of a sudden the story appears. Mm. Uh, you know, it's a spiritual thing, I guess. Right, right, right. I don't know. Kevin, have you ever had writer's block? I think I'm still real new at it. It's just more about getting time to do it. Distraction. Yeah, it's <laughs> Exactly, right. the distractions. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah, you make plans, really you're going to do something, and then yeah. something yeah. happens, and you don't get back to it for a couple of days or a week. Right. Yeah. I mean, even when we're locked down, we're still distracted by a million things, aren't we? Yeah, yeah. Jan, how about you? 10 books for 10 plus books? How do you get through writer's block? Does it happen? Oh yeah, quite often. Yeah, I yeah, I was I was halfway through writing the second book in the series and I got writer's block. And uh what I did, we we were move in the process of moving house at the same time. So I couldn't mm. couldn't focus on, on the story I was writing. So what I did, I set that aside and just had an idea for something else and I started writing that. And, and I use that as a distraction just to get just to get into the flow of writing again, and then that became the first book in another series eventually. But then once we'd moved house uh, and things started to settle down again, I could focus on the book that I'd started. So I went back to that, finished that one off, and then came back to the the other idea that was just a, a little a little short story, and I expanded on that later. So. Yeah, like you say, a lot of it's distraction. Um, so sometimes you need another distraction to take it off that one. So just to get you back in the flow of writing. I, I'm so glad you said that because I often recommend that, that very thing. If you're hitting a block here, then work on this instead. Now, um, whether that means a different chapter or even a different project, um, you know, write something else, you know, yeah. for fun. And you might like what you're doing and want to go with it or you might get led back to the first thing but at least you're not sitting there i don't i don't think sitting there being frustrated by writer's block helps that just makes it worse yeah. that just makes it worse yeah so at least you're doing something then yeah at least you're moving forward i would yeah. guess 
Not that I exercise as much as cage men. <laughs> but I would guess that there are some days that doing, you know, cardio or strength training or something, and you're just kind of done and you just don't want to do it. And maybe switching it up a little bit would help you push through. Yeah. Distraction, yeah. Just take your mind off things. I mean, spoken as a non-exerciser, am I right there? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> although although i should exercise more we did just put like a little mini gym in our house um because my kids wanted to work out and can't go you know couldn't go to the gym during all of this so now my house looks like your house there cage man okay <laughs> gotta start somewhere gotta start yeah. somewhere so uh I, I'm so not into it. So not only did we put in a, a bicycle and a weight machine, I put in a TV set too. So that's, <laughs> that's, important. that's very important. That and music. That's right. That's what I thought. I thought this way I would actually do something. <laughs> so what's next on the agenda? We know Jan is working on another book. Uh, Kevin, how about you? What are you doing next? Week two. Week two. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there is a love interest in the book, and um, uh, you were even asked, uh, I'm dying to know what happens with the girl. I want to know what happens with the girl. That was the first thing I said to you on the phone. What happened with the girl? <laughs> I, hope they, I hope they're together still. That's what I wanted to know. <laughs> now, how long did you work for the post office? Eight years. Oh, that's okay. a lot of books. Eight years. If you go one at a time, you're going to have over 400 books. One week at a yes, time. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of there's a lot of room there. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot of books. If you can remember, if you can remember back a week at a time, good for you. Yeah. That's amazing. And Peter, how about you? What are you working on next? Well, since I'm a nonfictioner, I'm working on since the uh, since I was a baby when a girl bit my finger while I was in the carriage, and then starting there all the way up <laughs> in my twenties. <20s. laughs> Did you remember that somebody beat your finger when you were in the carriage? You know what? Growing up, I still remember her face. No way. Finger, if I see her, I'm going to bite her finger back. She's not going to know what the hell. We're... <laughs> now, I, I was thinking you were going to tell me, you know, 20 years later, you married her or something. No, no, no. No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't marry somebody who's going to bite you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if she was but, uh, two. <laughs> and that's, you know, I have stories written already, but there's more in my head. You know, when I worked in the clothing store, I, I wrote it all about the different characters, the, the managers, the salesmen. I just wrote that recently. That's going to be in there, too. And becoming a teenager is funny. You know, how we used to spit. That was cool. Spitting out in the winter. You were freezing. Yeah, yeah. And you get thrown out of the store because you weren't buying anything. You wanted to keep warm. And we used to watch our spit freeze. <laughs> we, we were dying for somebody's mother to invite us in. You know, but things like that, you know. And it, but, you know, that's more for my family and, you know. Oh, well, that's fun, though. And, that, and, you know, I love memoirs for your family. What a gift to be able to leave right. for your family to, to know you because... I mean, I hate to be fatalistic, but, you know, the four of us are not going to be here forever. Right. You're leaving that behind. <laughs> you know, so I think that that's just amazing that others will be able to absolutely know you. Uh, the first book, when we first opened our publishing house years ago at Red Penguin Books, um, we were about to publish our very first books. And all of a sudden, I realized kind of like <gasps> the gravity of the moment that this was going to be the first books published by our, our new imprint. And I paused. And my mother, uh, thankfully, when my stepfather <coughs> was suffering with Alzheimer's, had interviewed him extensively and had pages and pages and a flash drive filled with these things. And we got everything together and edited it down and published his memoir. It's something like 360 pages long um, as the first book from Red Penguin Books because I wanted the first to be important. And I always say, and Peter, this is exactly from you, um, it is you know, one of my most prized possessions. Uh, if the proverbial house was on fire, that would be what I would grab, but I don't have to because it's on Amazon. So, and, and what a gift I gave it to, you know, 
my mother and to all the children and grandchildren as soon as it came out and forever. Some, someday their children and children's children can know this man. And Thanks. I love that. That is just such a gift. So anytime any of you were writing personal, I think it is a huge gift, you know, yes, to, to uh, a legacy, but also to our collective legacy, you know, uh, for all of us to be able to read back on what people were like back, because, you know, me people's memories are short, they forget things, and we need to remember things. That's so, so very important. So I'm glad you're doing that. I'm very, very selfishly glad you're doing that. That's for sure. Well, one more recommendation from each of you for our viewers, um, whether you have a book that you love and want to recommend, a movie, a television show, because we are so influenced by everything that we consume. Uh, Cage Man, do you have something to recommend to us? Um, well, of course, insufficient postage, Ronan, and um, behind. Uh, yes, absolutely. Well, I, you're <laughs> right. I should start by telling you my recommendations are absolutely Jailhouse Confidential, Jailhouse Confidential Insufficient Postage, and Ronan. That's what I'm recommending for everybody. <laughs> now, yeah, and I want to tell, tell Peter that my father was in corrections out here on Long Island, the country clubs. And um, no, but there were very, there were some stories, some real stories that, like you said, will, won't happen today. Yeah, you know, right. you, you can relate. <laughs> for, sure. for sure. And I, I actually met some of the guys that knew him at work. It's a different world now. <laughs> the world is a different world now. Yeah. yeah. True. Uh, the world is a different world now. So, do I, I, any of the three of you have any favorite authors or books? or media that you'd like to share? Who goes first? <laughs> Jan, you want to go? Uh, my favorite at the minute is Matthew Riley. Ah, good choice, good choice. You read them up, huh? Yeah, I've, I'm waiting for the, the latest Jack West book come out. It's due out this year. I'm just, I've got it on pre-order. I'm waiting for it to arrive. As soon as that comes, I will be pouring myself into it. Good for you. Good for you. Um, uh, Cage Man, do you read? Do you watch? Yes, you yes I'm, I'm a fan of Dean Koontz. Ooh, and, uh, the like that me. Yeah. Awesome writer. Awesome, yeah. awesome writer. Yeah, In fact, one of my most frightening memories of my life was I was listening to a Dean Koontz novel on an audio book and I was driving long distance on a dark and stormy night. And oh boy. <laughs> like a combination. Uh, combination. <laughs> Peter, do you like to read? You know what? I when I read more, I write more, I notice. Mm. You know, and uh, I'm looking for a book now to read. Okay. And um, I usually read kind of like the uh, like the self-help books, the mind books. Okay. Like that, you know. Like reflections and stuff like that, but I'm looking for a book to read now. Okay. And uh, I already read yours. <laughs> <laughs> Personal development books are great to read. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, yeah. if anybody is watching and wants to throw some things into the links as a, a recommendation for Peter to read next, but I'm gonna read these books. Absolutely, got to read these books. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That's the goal. And and to our viewers, you better hurry up because they're all working on some others. So you better read them fast. Yeah. That's yeah. for sure. Well, the three yeah. of you, thank you so much for joining me on the show. And thank you for all of this fabulous writing. Keep it up. Thank, thank you, Stephanie. We'll see you soon, Stephanie. Take care. Thanks for joining us on Between the Covers. I hope you enjoyed the show. If you're an author who would be interested in appearing on our show, or perhaps you're a member of a book club, we do host book clubs as well, please visit betweenthecoverstv.com. By the way, at betweenthecoverstv.com, you can watch past episodes in addition to learning more about our authors and guests. So sign up there if you would like to be a guest on the show yourself. And if you have some books that you would like to get written or published, visit redpenguinbooks.com. Thanks so much for joining us.